It's actually with great pleasure that I introduce uh, Kim Wheeler, AICP, MRP 2004, and also former student of mine. You, you, you experienced my field workshops. Yes. Uh, she's the executive director of the Susquehanna Economic Development Association and Council of Governments, uh, better known as CETACOG, located in Lewisburg in uh, central Pennsylvania. Uh, it is a regional community and economic development agency serving 11 counties in central Pennsylvania. And Kim took the helm of CETACOG in January of 2021. She has worked at every level of government in Pennsylvania over the last 19 years, from actually her first job, fresh out of city and regional planning at CETACOG, and then on to other work expertise, experience in local government and state government arenas, and brings a substantial reservoir of expertise in urban and regional planning, strategic planning, local government and policy development, and again, at both the state and local levels. Her tenure in central Pennsylvania has been characterized by public-private partnership building, developing innovative initiatives, providing local government leadership, and helping communities craft funding strategies and plans that lead to impactful results for the long term. She was special project coordinator and grants manager for the borough of Lewisburg, Pennsylvania, prior to returning to CETACOG. And after spending 14 years in various other governmental positions in the region, she was the deputy director of planning at the Lycoming County Planning Commission for nearly seven years. And she was a local government policy specialist and North Central Region Community Planner for the Pennsylvania Department of Community and Economic Development prior to that. Uh, Kim, as noted, earned her Master's of Regional Planning from the Department of City and Regional Planning in 2004, and her Bachelor's of Architecture from SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry in Syracuse. She earned her planning certification from the American Institute of Certified Planners, AKA the AICP in 2007. CETACOG serves a region covering over 6,400 square miles or 16,000 square kilometers. It is a very rural region with an overall population density of around 110 persons per square mile are around 40, 45 persons per square kilometer. It's an area of region where 70% of the residents live in rural, non-urban areas, and the average population of its largest cities is less than 10,000 persons. It is a highly diverse region comprised of small towns with a rich history of industrial innovation that continues to this day, surrounded by highly productive agricultural lands and home to growing Amish and Mennonite Anabaptist agrarian communities, whose horse-drawn buggies and farm equipment share the local highways with Prii and Teslas. The region is dominated visually by the forested slopes of the Appalachian Mountains and the Allegheny Plateau that cover almost half of the land in the region. In the east, former coal towns of the anthracite coal region struggle economically, while in the west, Penn State University fuels prosperity in Center County. In the south, the mountains and small towns of Perry County abut the Harrisburg metro area, while in the north, the forests of the Allegheny Plateau cover much of Lycoming and Clinton County. 
It is a politically and culturally conservative region. It is a region of small governments, few of which have the local government capacity to support more than basic municipal services. So without further ado, I welcome Kim Wheeler. Thank you very much, Kim. Thank you, George. So great to see you again. <laughs> well, hello, everyone. Thank you for having me today. It's such a pleasure to be back. Uh, I love giving presentations, but boy, this is quite the different room. <laughs> this is something different than 20 year, 19 years ago in Sibley Hall. We had colloquium in a much smaller space. So um, I can't see everyone's faces, but I'll, um, I'll try to look up as much as I can to connect with you. Um, it, you know, I was just saying to a small group of students a little earlier that uh, my two years here at Cornell were the hardest two years of my life but the best two years of my life, truly. I look back on these two years and I just can't come up with another set of such invigorating, rewarding, special time in my life. I mean, I've, I'm married with kids. I love all of, <laughs> all of my life right now, but it's, it just is a special place to learn and to really collaborate and for, for such meaningful work that we're gonna do for the rest of our lives. So. I hope that all of you enjoy your moments here, and I hope that I could bring something to the conversation and and the you know the discussions ongoing in the classroom and elsewhere. So thanks again for having me, and I think I got the clicker that will move me forward. And George did such a great job introducing me. I don't have a ton more to say about myself, but I do have um, a slide <laughs> that I usually try to put up here. Let me see if I got this right. Nope. Where do I click? Yeah. <laughs> I forget where to click. Maybe it didn't connect. Second. Okay, what do I press? Forward. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so George pretty much went over this. I don't need to give a lot more detail here, but um, I have worked in both rural and urban places throughout the not only 11 county region that I currently serve, but um, a much larger territory without, within the Commonwealth in many of my other um, positions. So you can see all the array of things that you can get into. Um, I, love, I love just having that diversity to be able to bring to the table because really when you're working and planning, you're touching on so many of these things on a daily basis. But I have truly had the opportunity to not only do land use planning and downtown revitalization where I started out, but um, housing development and redevelopment. When you're a planner, you're touching so many different facets of the community and economic development world. Um, and you become a really valuable asset to the partners and players that are getting things done on the grounds, um, whether it's infrastructure and environmental planning. Floodplain management is a huge piece of the work that we're dealing with in the central region of Pennsylvania. We have over 500 miles of streams and rivers just through our region alone. So we have quite a lot, a lot of floodplain management issues um, and policy that we work on. Um, I, I just wanted to spend one moment talking a little bit about like how I got here, how I got there from here. I grew up in suburban New York City, and then I went to college and grad school in upstate New York, both up here. Um, I studied cities, I studied regional planning, uh, landscape architecture, and then I ended up in, in central rural Pennsylvania, and I knew nothing about rural issues. <laughs> I thought, well, how, how am I going to do this? What, you know, I don't really know. I never really studied rural issues, and that came up in some of the conversation today at lunch as well. But I fell in love with the landscape and the opportunity to make a difference. Uh, some people say that central Pennsylvania can be sticky, and well, I guess I agree. <laughs> um, I've been there now for 19 years and really enjoyed the diversity of opportunities that I have had just, and I've stayed living in Lewisburg, which is the home of Bucknell University, if anybody is familiar with that college. We're just three hours south of here. But I quickly realized that not many people like me were choosing to move and build their careers in central Pennsylvania. I didn't see many other Cornell grads, although there were some. I didn't see, I didn't encounter many degreed planners and landscape architects, 
although there were actually more in a two square mile radius than I would have imagined, um, there were still very few. But regardless, I realized the region needed someone like me with my background, experience, training, and passion to help address the issues of today and tomorrow. And that's a lot of the reason why I have stayed where I, where I am. But I, I never would have imagined that I would have taken the path that I did. But today I stand in front of you as the executive director of an 11 county regional community and economic development organization. And I am thrilled to be able to share my experiences with you. Um, but before I move on, I am curious about who is in the audience. Um, so if you wouldn't mind, I know I can't go through uh, one by one, but just from a, a, you know, a hand's sake standpoint, maybe we can at least get a sense for who comes from more urbanized areas of the world. <laughs> a lot. Okay. All right. And, and what about more anybody coming from rural, more rural areas? Okay. So we have a good segment and then suburban a few from suburban like myself i came from suburban new york <laughs> um and i think you will find that this program will set you up for work in any of those three areas i mean you can certainly specialize but what i have found over my time is that the critical thinking skills the analysis work that we learn here in this program and the programs here in aap um, just really set you up for whatever problem solving you are going to need to encounter in your career. So um, it may have been scary the moment I said yes to that <laughs> job offer in rural Pennsylvania. It has been nothing but a pleasure to be able to navigate my way through um, and figure out how to solve problems for people who don't, people in communities who don't have those, those capacities. So um, I leave you with that. We, we may come back to the audience in a moment, but any, anything else, anybody you want to share anything in terms of where you're from that's maybe very unique or different than the rest of the crowd and that's okay if you don't all right well i'll move on and george did cover some of this already but uh so i don't really need to to go into what seat council of government is but i really wanted to spend a little bit of time contextually about what i'm doing before we get into the rural examples um but CEDACOG was set up in the, in the 1960s by the Appalachian Regional Commission to provide, sorry, I hit that, <laughs> so community and economic development services to the underserved parts of Pennsylvania. Um, and so again, it's an 11 county um, organization that we are actually situated in the woods, <laughs> three miles south of the town of Lewisburg where Bucknell University is. Those 11 counties are depicted here in all caps lettering. Um, you could take a look. The county seats are in the ones with the green dots. And in this rural region, there are 295 municipalities, four cities, 76 boroughs, 213 townships, and it likes to advance by itself, <laughs> and one municipality that they call a town. That equates to a population of about 682,000 people in these 11 counties. So 11 counties, central PA, yes, very rural, but we still have, you know, near three quarters of a million in the population. Um, like Homing County, the one there at the top where Williamsport is the county seat, that is the largest city in the region. It's 30,000. It is the home of the Little League World Series for anybody who likes to watch the 12 year olds play, play uh, baseball in August. It's fabulous. Um, come down sometime, free games. <laughs> um, and then Montour County, which is a little bit southeast of, of Lycoming there, um, is, is the smallest county um, in the, in the Commonwealth, but like homing itself is is larger than the state of Rhode Island area wise square area wise so a couple of little fun facts there. Um, and Lewisburg is between Williamsport and Harrisburg, um, which is below Perry County there, which is the capital city of Harrisburg. Um, there are cities small boroughs rural townships of all sizes in between all of that now. A little bit about the organization that I work for, where we we have quite a number of different buckets, I guess you would call it, of services, business services, community services, residential, and transportation. And we're fortunate to have been able to evolve over the last 50 years to capitalize on new and emerging opportunities that has kept our work exciting and relevant um, for the needs of the region. So this wasn't, in 1968, when this organization started, it was about one third of these services. And we've really grown over time 
to advance uh, to you know advance the service offerings and the funding sources to be able to bring to the region well before my time, of course. Um, but we strive to have a whole community approach. And therefore, we've been able to grow beyond the typical rural development agency in terms of services. Uh, infrastructure planning and development is one of the most critical things that CEDACOG is involved with to, assess, to assist economic development in the region. Um, and that goes for you know, transportation planning, the economic development infrastructure planning, um, and we work with our counties and our economic development agencies, planning commissions to, to get those projects off the ground. Um, as a local development district, we have access to a lot of federal funds from the Appalachian Regional Commission, from the Economic Development Administration, USDOT, FHWA, the federal highways, and, and the list goes on. But they augment and leverage the other development dollars being brought to projects to come to the finish, finish line. So we're really luck lucky to be able to funnel those dollars through our organization into these 11 counties. And as part of the responsibility for those organizations that we receive federal funds for, we actually provide, we actually have to create a five-year comprehensive economic development strategy called a SEDS. Um, and most economic development organizations like us have to do that throughout the region, throughout the country. Um, and we do that with our regional partners. And it's kind of like a big comprehensive plan. I guess that's the way I can uh, best characterize it. But we do that every five years with all, so it's much bigger than a comprehensive plan for a municipality and a county. It's 11 counties wide. So it's pretty significant. Um, we do a ne the next one in 2025. The CEDACOG region also has this Metropolitan Planning Organization, or MPO, um, for eight of our 11 counties. So we're designated as the transportation planning agency that works with PennDOT, the DOT, um, to deliver transportation dollars to the region. And one of the ways we do that is by completing their own transportation plan called the Long Range Trans Transportation Plan every 12 years that finds the investments and the updates it every, every year with a project list um, to accommodate the next year's um, capital investments. But this transportation planning and infrastructure, I can't underscore it enough because it sets the stage, stage and must work hand in hand with land use planning efforts and sound economic development decision making. We are really lucky to have all of these critical pieces of economic development um, in, our, in our wheelhouse um, in central Pennsylvania. We're lucky to be able to have all those things under one roof. So, here we, we see um, a map, that's the state of Pennsylvania. Um, number six is my region. So that's the region we just looked at. Um, you can see that there are six other regional organizations like CEDACOG in the state of Pennsylvania that covers 52, so that those six regions, likes to advance, I better keep that down here. <laughs> 52 of the 67 counties in Pennsylvania are covered by these kinds of um, organizations. And that covers what we consider the Appalachian region of Pennsylvania. So the Appalachian region, just because to put this all into context, right now we're looking at the whole East Coast pretty much. It includes 423 counties across 13 states. It spans 206,000 square miles from New York to Northern Mississippi. Um, and you can see, and I, I don't know why, it must be on some kind of timer. <laughs> I don't remember doing that. Um, but we are a, CEDACOG is a local development district under that Appalachian Regional Commission that governs and provides funding and technical assistance for these 13 states. And their mission really is to innovate, partner, and invest to build community capacity and strengthen economic growth in Appalachia. And since 1965, they have invested $4.5 billion in this region that you're looking at right now. Much of that has um, been matched with um, over $10 billion at the local and state levels as well. Um, and while significant improvements have been made in key economic factors, such as poverty, per capita income, and high school graduation rates, you'll find that Appalachia still lags behind the rest of the nation on average. In fact, Tompkins County is one of the 14 Appalachian counties here in New York State. So uh, if you look there, there's 14 at the lower tier there. Um, you're part of the Appalachian region as well. 
So in terms of looking at the health and prosperity of regions, the Appalachian Regional Commission has, it uses its own index, as many others do as well, based on econo an economic classification that identifies and monitors economic status of the Appalachian counties. The system uses three <laughs> the system uses three averages for un, uh, including unemployment rates, per capita market income, and poverty rates to compare to the national averages. That's the Appalachian Regional Commission's methodology. We'll talk a little bit more about how it's done elsewhere. But each county is then ranked, and then com a composite, you know, they comp compile the index value and classify that into one of five categories, economic status designations, based on the position and its national ranking. And you see that in the legend there, from distress all the way down to attainment. So that's the sort of terminology and categorization that I have I work within within the constructs of the the world of Appalachia. Um, distressed counties are the most economically depressed counties, and they rank among the top the worst ten percent in the nation's counties. Um, all of the regions and subregions in Appalachia have local development districts covering their counties, just like my region, just my, my region and my organization. They're not all, they all look the same. Ours is somewhat sophisticated, I would say, compared to others, but some of them provide economic development, social services, sometimes housing, um, and it does, it does differentiate depending on the state. Uh, but there is a, an organization for all of these counties that you see on the screen. So back to, why am I back to this? Why do we exist? I think is an important question to ask. Um, truly, the lack of capacity at the local level is a big part of that answer. The Pennsylvania local development districts are set up to be an extension of county services and provide shared services <laughs> throughout their regions. Um, so why do I spend so much time talking about this? Um, not into the meat of this presentation yet, because the resources, capacity, politics, and partnerships are the name of the game to plan the possible in rural America. And if you don't have those, though, that infrastructure, you're going to continue to be left behind. There are no community development corporations in my area. There are very few economic development organizations that are actually building and doing the work. And truly there's a lack of professional planners. And now we need to, to build those, those bridges and partnerships to leverage assets so that we can advance these communities, recruit, retain talent, help rural towns and communities stay competitive. And that is exactly what local development districts do. We do that work. I put this slide up because there are over 15 different definitions of rural used by federal agencies and programs alone. Federal regulations also have their own um, defining characteristics and often change their definition based on the laws when they're amended, adding further confusion to the mix. Um, and then you have, you have groups, um, like I think it's up on the screen, the Economic Innovation Group, which has been doing some really innovative work lately. I've been in the rural realm. And um, they are trying to blend the definitions to find a better understanding of how traditional rural areas of the country change over time and can actually be classified differently based on their, how their economies are changing. So not just on a status figure and basic numbers and, and, and statistical analysis, but how are they changing over time? And there's some really good progress and prosperity um, types of stories that change, that if you look at these models, they are changing over time. And you probably could pick out some in, in some of the states where maybe many of you are from um, to see whether was, they move from distressed to progressively up the list to attainment. It's very been interesting to watch over the years. Nearly two thirds of rural counties have experienced or did experience population loss from 2010 to 2019. Uh, according to the U.S. Census, 91% of rural counties lost prime working age population between those years of 2010 and 2019, and over 51% lost 10% or more. The norm in rural areas is a stagnating or declining population. So what you see here, um, the red is showing a greater than 10% population loss between those years, and the orange is, is zero to 10%. So you can see the staggering number of counties throughout the country that 
that fit this criteria. We've got a lot of population loss. It's probably not dissimilar to a lot of the, the data and information you've been seeing. Um, maybe you see it opposite, you know, where it's growing, where the density is growing in our country. I'm showing you the opposite. Here's the internal parts of our country and look how, look how we are losing that population. So from a poverty and prosperity standpoint, um, it's no, it's it, it's no secret. Rural areas lag behind in every almost every me measure of prosperity, from poverty rates to labor force participation, and twice as many rural counties are economically distressed um, than they are prosperous. In general, um, it's probably again no surprise, but rural areas are older. They tend to have fewer people with a college degree and tend to experience population loss more than their non-rural counterparts. But there's but there's but here. Rural America does really truly boast a rich diversity of identity, employment, culture, and experiences. I mean, just in my region alone, we have, I don't know, did I, over 13 colleges and universities. And so the diversity of population that comes just with that alone and the communities and the institutions and the partnering organizations that um, support them is, is really something unique in rural America. Um, so there is quite the bit of diversity depending on where you go. Rural areas have a higher self-employment rate than their urban counterparts, and rural areas will really are seen to be a central part of the modernization and transition when it comes to um, the nation's key industries. And I was just sharing a little while ago that um, just in the last five, maybe 10 years in our region, we've really started to see manufacturing coming back to America, to the to Pennsylvania, and particularly our region. So we sent it overseas decades ago, and now we are we are we're really rebuilding an infrastructure. Some of it is related to the terrain, the context of the you know the outdoors, the outdoor industry, economic industry is huge and growing in Pennsylvania. But the manufacturing industry is coming there right long alongside it because people want to locate and industries want to locate where people um, enjoy the quality of life. And that's a big part of it as well and have access to rural, you know, natural lands. Okay. This is interesting. Recently, there has been a number of groups having the conversation about redefining or reimagining rural. Um, the Economic in Innovation Group, again, is using, they're using a broad diversity of socioeconomic indicators to assess everything from rural prosperity to distress. In fact, I really seem, I like the way that, way that they, if you could look them up, I didn't put a, I don't know if you guys do QR codes or what, but you look them up. They're doing some interesting stuff. Um, and they've been looking at how to look at the prosperity. Is it a persistent prosperity in the rural area, budding or slipping. So they have a whole organizational system and category, you know, categorization of how they're fitting our communities and counties into that. And I think it's productive to start looking at where we need to focus um, our efforts from a financial and capacity um, standpoint. Um, the Brookings Institute, on the other hand, recognizes that opportunity exists for the federal government to be a strong and innovative partner in setting rural communities up for success. They've been doing a lot of work lately. Again, look up the Brookings Institute and on their rural podcasts and, um, and some of the work that they research that they've been put, spinning out. They're advocating that it will require a transformation in mindset and modernization of its architecture and tools. That means the federal government, how it's interacting with the you know, rural communities of America. In fact, sometimes we feel like they're doing better overseas with our aid and our technical assistance that we do in our own home land sometimes. Um, but the federal leadership really does need to intensify to reverse the county, the country's geographic divergence in prosperity and well-being if rural America is going to stay competitive. One of the things that I thought was interesting to bring um, bring up, and maybe I can share the link when it happens um, with Chris or whoever gets the word out here, but um, I was interviewed la just last month in August by the Brookings Institute. They're doing a new podcast called Reimagining Rural, and it was hosted by Tony Pippa who actually hails from Pennsylvania. So he was familiar with some of the work that we are doing, um, particularly in a community 
in a coal community. So George spoke about some of the area that I cover has old coal communities that have really been in that slipping category, right? Are they are they teetering on the fence? Are they going to make it? They're not going to make it moving forward. And what's happened over the last three years is astonishing. And not solely because of our efforts, there's just been a whole momentum and it does revolve around the outdoor economic industry and a whole lot of things happening in around that community. But during COVID, when we saw when we saw businesses close in just about every community, we saw 13 new businesses in Main Street opening in the in the city of Shamokin, small small city, but coal community because of the the advance the the investments that have been had been put to place in and around that community in the outdoor industry, outdoor adventure, um, recreation parks, ATV parks, trails, um, all sorts of all sorts of connectors um, that really make a difference in industries and, and companies are starting to move to that community too, not just small businesses. So what they're doing on the podcast is actually showing seven different communities around the nation, Shimokin from my region being one of them. So I'm really proud to, to be able to be a part of that effort. Um, and their purpose was to showcase showcase rural America demographically, economically, geographically, and explore how local leadership institutions and solutions are put, being pulled together to revitalize rural communities. And, and highlight some of the capacity building. We're fortunate to have gotten a grant from the state to put a person for three years in that community. And part of the region re reason why they've pulled in over $15 million in the last three years is because we've been able to have that capacity in that community, um, which would never have happened otherwise. So um, exploring those kinds of reforms and innovations is part of that podcast that the Brookings Institute is hopeful to have out by the end of the year. So stay tuned. And, and this is all about what I call asset-based development. That community would never have had the opportunity if it wasn't because of the natural assets and the lands, the rural landscape that it has and people are flocking there from all, all the urban areas to be able to enjoy a weekend a week in that area right now. So I'm gonna move on to this, um, the, the next question of the day, which is why plan? I hear that all the time. Why do I hear that? Why are we planning? And um, so I, I guess I say now back to the regularly scheduled program, <laughs> the reality-based planning in rural America was the title of this talk, um, but threat number one, and tell me if that slide changes, because I'm not looking up there, but it's on some kind of timer. But threat number one is that they are not accustomed to planning. And I find, I, I, so I spent about six months living in Mexico during undergraduate, and I did a lot of planning work, even though I was a landscape architect. And it was a challenge to get them to think about planning. They hadn't even had a word that that, you, that they equated to planning um, in you know in the Yucatan Peninsula at the time, and so I found when I came to to Pennsylvania that there was a lot of similarities with the way the the economy and the communities operated, um, and it did get better. I'd say it has gotten better over the last twenty years. We've advanced. We have definitely um, come to terms with why we need to plan in large part, but in rural communities, all, all too often change happens to them rather than planning for change that will improve the quality of life or the, and their economic advantage. We have reminded community leaders, legislators, and citizens that planning really truly is the means to get things accomplished. Um, it's not just about getting a bag of money <laughs> and, and being able to put it somewhere, because how are you gonna get that bag of money? I often ask communities, why do you think some, some communities get get funds and funded grants and others do not? Um, and it's because they plan. <laughs> if you plan and show that you have a, you know, how you a plan on how you're going to invest the dollars, that what the impact's going to be, the outcome, the advantage, that's where the money goes. And there was not a true understanding a long time ago when I started in this region on how that happens. It was a, there was a lot of um, consternation as to why one community got funds and another didn't. Um, but to planners, the implementation traditionally means what executing specific programs, actions, policies, including amending things like land use regulations um, to achieve objectives and fulfill recommendations in the plan. But really what that means is that visible actions are taking place to solve problems, meet community needs, and make community investments. It also means that community development and investments for things like public facilities are following a vision, principles, and policies 
in the plan, right? Things that we're learning in school. <laughs> But implementation, um, it really is that step in the rational model for planning, traditionally embraced by planners. But when you get out here, the reality is that it becomes the neglected stepchild. So it's hard to do this work because nobody really truly understand it, it stands it. To be relevant and valuable, especially in a place that doesn't value the practice of planning, you need to learn quickly how to be an implementer. So I've learned over the years that that's what matters. You need to figure out how to do the planning to get them up to speed as quickly as possible and do those processes, but you need to be an implementer. I often have to start here. <laughs> Headlines like these can be found almost any in any local newspaper in the, in the state, in the country, almost any day of the week. Elected officials everywhere must deal with land use and planning issues constantly. So when they ask why plan, I say, well, if you don't plan for the future of your community, somebody else will. Change happens all of the time, whether you like it or plan for it or not. And it all, everything is related to land use. Everyone cares about land use because somebody lives next door to everything. And officials, public officials will be held accountable whether they are responsible or not. So they better care about land use and how that plays out and whether or not they have a zoning ordinance or not. Uh, so these are the kinds of conversations I started my career out having. <laughs> so why plan? So we can be strategic and set priorities. Where can we target investments? How much can we leverage to pull together the needed investments to make the change that we want? And to what extent can we make impact through our efforts? I ask them questions like, would you rather live next to an abandoned industrial complex or a well-managed, well-designed apartment building? Should we have a low-income housing development in isolation in an industrial district? Or should residents be acclimated back into the rest of the community and the site be repurposed to maximize its potential adjacent to the rail line? Those are those two examples I bring to you today. These are the kinds of situations and questions that we seek to work through during the planning process on a regular basis in rural America. There are always unexpected occurrences, such as natural disasters, like floods, for instance. We're not always fully prepared for what comes our way, but having sound policies and practices for managing risk and change paves our path for community resiliency and the ability to recover from those negative effects. So we do actually have quite a bit of resiliency planning because of the flooding that we happen to have in our communities. That's one good aspect. We actually have a flood resiliency program um, in our organization. I'm grateful for that. It's I love it to be bigger and maybe with some of the stimulus coming through, we can provide more assistance, but there's a lot of threats in our region to this natural disaster. Um, so why plan? because we have beautiful historic communities to be proud of and to continue to enjoy and nurture throughout our lifetime. And because the character of our towns is important to the attraction of our region. So we go back to the economic side of it. A whole community care and long-term resiliency approach does not happen by itself. It takes a lot of people thinking about what the means and mechanics or me you know, mechanics are on how to achieve it. And as we said, as I said earlier, rural areas lag behind on a lot of things. Um, and this is just one of those things. These examples are not, you know, are definitely not the norm. Um, sorry, the ones on the screen there. <laughs> these are these are some of the best communities that have quite the capacity or the planning going on behind it to keep them um, very well attended to. So how do we build success in rural America? In order to have a competitive advantage, against larger, more populous, and more urban areas of the state, we have developed a way of doing business that focuses on regional collaboration. Among organizations, institutions, businesses, and local governments, so that we can leverage our resources and our assets that we have in order to plan and develop our infrastructure and ready ourselves for growth and recruitment opportunities. The region I work in is proud, you know, as I mentioned, a proud home to over a dozen colleges and university that brings us even further opportunities for collaboration. It's great to have those resources, but also an entrepreneurial mindset that you don't often don't find in rural areas um, and the ability to have innovative applications to solving problems and then bringing those business ideas to the region. 
Four things are important um, that I think on building success, creating plans that are implementable, building those partnerships to succeed, patience, a lot of patience, <laughs> and then understanding the politics. So I'm gonna start with implementing plans. Um, I worked at the Department of Community and Economic Development for the state, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania for five years, providing a lot of technical assistance and funding to local governments throughout the state um, for land use plans, zoning ordinances, master and strategic plans, comprehensive plans. Too many times we had requests to fund new plans because the old ones didn't get implemented. Our planning team started to ask the question, why? Why are they not getting adopted or just sitting on the shelf? The more we encountered the same thing over and over, we realized that the responsibility of implementation of the plan was somewhat ambiguous. For some reason, the professional planners, the planning commissions, or the elected officials were not taking responsibility and therefore planning was getting a bad rap. Why plan if nothing comes from it? They just sit on the shelf. This was particularly the sentiment in rural central Pennsylvania. Um, my, one of my colleagues, Denny Puko, has now published a book about what we learned during our time at the Department of Community and Economic Development and how we can change the results of planning. We started this conversation when I was there and we call it the implementable comprehensive plan process. And I wanted to share a little bit about that with you because the old way of doing business is prepare a book, review the book, submit the book and hope for results. Um, and really what we're talking about today is stop creating plans that don't get implemented. Let's think differently. Focus on what actually needs to change in a community rather than relying on formula or one size fits all approaches. Look for the trends and emerging patterns rather than recording just the facts. Um, so many times I walked into planning offices and their planning books are this big, you know, and who's diving through all of that data. And today it's digital, I get it. Um, but, uh, you know, capture that energy and commitment of the residents and the community groups that help to build the capacity to make the change. That's the important piece here. To, and then to develop strategies, very specific strategies that initiate that change, including implementing steps that are matched with the financial capabilities of that community and the resources available to them. Um, those are some really key things. So what we're looking at now is a different way of, uh, you know, of, of going about the planning process. Not so much book oriented, but how do we generate the ideas? How do we put plans and ideas into action? How do we create the capacity and the buy-in for the people who are gonna actually implement? If the community members feel that they own the plan, they will also own the implementation. That is the purpose behind meaningful engagement. And this goes for whether you're in a rural, a suburban, an urban area. It's so critical. Now, the partners are different. The people are different. There may be a whole ton more different kinds of sophistication happening in different size communities. But truly getting to the people and understanding the population, and that's why we do all that demographic analysis and understanding who's there, who's merging, what are the important pieces. But we need to know the people and have the conversations with the people that are living there and wanting to stay there. Um, so the creating the implementable comprehensive plan process, I have five steps laid out that I thought were pretty interesting, you know, pieces just to, to mark on today. Um, that piece about focusing on the real relevant issues, really, again, just the planning, the plan needs to focus on providing answers and ideas to the real community issues. Um, and it's if for it to more likely get implemented. So, um, I'll talk about it in a moment in terms of the, the, the buckets that we usually put things in here. Organizing the plan, it's under organizing the plan, the way that the elected officials and citizens think. It's just a little bit of a different way of organizing a plan, but do we always need to follow a template or formulaic way of, do, of, of, of putting together a book or a plan to help the community achieve their aspirations and solve their problems? Sometimes these are not the same methodology. The old way is, okay, we have a bucket for transportation. We have to deal with housing. We have to deal with economic development, um, you know, land use, et cetera. The new way of organizing, I would call it as it's issue-based, right? So example, we have a dangerous intersection, uh, you know, that needs to be addressed. We have a blighted neighborhood or an underutilized business park. Organizing the plans by issue instead of by functional elements, here's the problem, right? Here's the data to substantiate it. 
Here are the best ideas for solving the problem. And then here are the steps and actions to help solve that problem. Should And, and how do we carry that out? Uh, those are, um, aside from working with that the planning commission early on, um, uh, hundreds of pages, <laughs> hundreds of pages, chapter by set chapter, bringing the consultant edits. That's the way we used to do business. And it's really not productive. Um, we want to be able to devise practical, practical, workable recommendations. And this means that planners need to shift how they spend their time, the hours that they spend their time typically being spent on exhaustively collecting data, um, and mapping development action plans focused, we really need to focus it on the implementation piece. In this model, planners don't go away into the back room and, and, you know, and do the work. They go out into the community and collaborate with the stakeholders to develop the, develop, uh, the relevant recommendations right there. You're doing it during the planning process to help solve those problems. And those action plans really are key. Uh, it creates a step-by-step -step guide to implementation. So when staff and elected officials turn over, anyone can still pick up that plan and continue to proceed step-by-step. -step, and it helps guide them, the communities, from where they start to where they finish. And then recruiting partners, number four, um, and the, the capacity. It's important that a structure and a, and a capacity of implementation be put in place before the plan is finalized. I've I've come to learn that is one of the biggest things. Before we finalize that plan, who's going to help us figure that out and, and implement? This cannot be underscored um, more, to be honest. It's it's the difficult part in rural areas. That's why regional partnerships and you know, and organizations like myself exist. Most communities have no professional staff. Sometimes counties don't even have a professional planner. Regional organizations um, and or a combination of local organizations often step up to take the different pieces of implementing responsibilities. But the planning process should involve organizations and individuals with expertise. And ultimately you want the planning process to create something that obviously is implementable for the priority community issues. Again, how do you make progress as a planner, being an implementer is a big piece of that. And building community excitement, this last piece, ownership and commitment sort of gets to all of that. A comprehensive plan that truly is owned by the community and is committed to is more likely to be implemented. Um, use that final presentation at the end of a planning process to celebrate the work that's being done, the partnerships, and energize the people into action, as opposed to just a presentation of what's inside the plan. I like this quote here, convincing, wor convincing words alone will not ensure implementation. Again, by Denny Puka, a former um, supervisor and boss of mine at the State Department of Economic Development. Uh, but interacting with the local governments, the economic development agencies, business people, community organizations, and the elected officials is what is going to make the difference. And, and so I think that's a big piece of what you learn when you get out there is just saying the right thing doesn't make it happen. We really need to build those coalitions and those people partners. This is an example of um, the plan that I worked on when I was with the, the County Planning Commission in Lycoming County. We did this in 2017 and 2018. We did a countywide plan as well as um, six multi-municipal, uh, again, this was four, 52, 52 municipalities in one county. Um, but we developed a logo and a slogan and it was called Lycoming 2030, Plan the Possible because we didn't want it to go on the shelf. What are the issues of today that we need to deal with in the next 10 years? Um, so you can see the, the notes on the slide there. That's, that's pretty much the points that we were trying to get to as the mission of this plan. Here's an example of some of the, um, the thematic issues. We built the plan chapters on issues, not topical areas. We analyzed what people were telling us and grouped similar sentiments together and ultimately devised statements that encompassed their concerns. I really love how this turned out. It makes so much sense, especially when looking for partners to help implement the plan. I highlighted a few in red just because they're kind of 
to me, I, I when I read them, I just want to roll my sleeves up and dig in because they're truly stated as issues, right? The economy is changing and our communities and workforce are not optimally positioned to realize our untapped economic potential and become resilient to economic trends. And so that was a chapter in and of itself of all the untapped economic potential in that county. Significant cultural and historical resources are not adequately documented, protected, and promoted. Uh, and we had a whole section on historic and cultural preservation, um, how important some of those resources were than we were finding in the county that were not protected, uh, not documented. And I think that was a, a significant part of the history and the draw to the, that part of the region. So recognizing that and working with the historical societies and organizations was a big part of the outcome there. This was an interesting statement, number seven. Fragmentation of local government in Pennsylvania is a barrier to efficient delivery of some public services. Now we had to craft that one pretty carefully because that's a hot political issue. Um, you know, you have a Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, you have 2,566 municipalities all with their own governing structure, with their own land use regulatory authority. It's a Dillon's rural state, which means that it all, all of that decision-making power is is given to the most local level of governments. And so all, as you see the notation, all six planning area teams, which means all of the multi-municipal plan areas and the county prioritize that statement as an issue to getting work done in the county. How do we overcome that? We're not gonna change the structure of, of the government. Um, and then you could see the other ones, drugs, particularly heroin, are creating significant social, economic, public health, and safety problems. And that was a whole collaboration with a set of partners that we never worked with before. And then lastly, I wanted to highlight number 12, volunteerism and civic engagement, particularly among young people, are insufficient to sustain community institutions and services. And I don't know how this relates to other areas of the country, but I will tell you it is rampant in, in rural areas that we're not not regenerating and building the community capacity and volunteerism to make uh, those institutions that run off volunteerism work. Even the elected bodies or appointed bodies are having a lot. You have people sitting on these boards and these committees for 10, 20, 30 years because there, there's just a lack of interest to come up the ranks or just the population decline is a combination of those things. I'm sure this is not alone. You know, we're not alone here in rural America, but um, it is an issue. It is an issue when, uh, you know, I, I can go on to my, uh, you know, go into my process of what I think needs to happen at the more um, junior level and in academia at the lower levels of grade school and really great getting people understanding how they can make a difference in our community. I think that's really critical. But anyway, these, these issues here, these 14 issues led to the development of a strategic action plan to solve those problems, which then lend, led itself to development projects. And I just wanted to show you real quickly, just the sort of an outline or the, the contents, how we organized the plan. We said, okay, here's the priority issue. So one of those 14 issues, what's the backstory? So what's the context of what's happening here? Uh, what's the backstory? What's the issue? What is the true issue of what we're seeing on the ground today? What are the implications if we don't deal with this? <laughs> what are the implications you know, uh, whether it's within our municipality or otherwise, if we do not handle this situation. Um, and then what are the what are the viable projects of regional significance that we can articulate and do something about? Not all the not the ones that we think are great or pie in the sky, but what are the possible uh, implementable projects that we can get our hands around with our current known partners? Um, so that's a little bit of how we organize the plan. And I, you know, it does take a village. It takes a building of partnerships. And so to get it done, we embrace the regional mindset. That's what we do in rural, <laughs> rural communities. Um, it seems with every new big project or opportunity, our region has been able to find new ways to partner, new entities to partner with. Some of them on the screen here, a lot of the ones we work with on a regular basis. We find better ways to maximize our resources new strategies to leverage our financial resources, more reasons to increase our economic potential. And in order to create the, the greatest impact, uh, these partnerships are critical. These are just a handful of the regional organizations that coordinate um, and lend their resources to ensure successful outcomes are happening in central Pennsylvania. 
And um, this is, a, I'm moving on now to an example. Because of these partnerships, there's some of the same here. And the small town of Lewisburg, I'm gonna use that one as an example today. 5,700 pop population of 5,700. In the greater Lewisburg area, it's probably about 17,000. But the borough of Lewisburg has been able to secure and, and, and implement over $15 million of public and private investments for community and economic development just in the last decade and a half. The most recent exciting project just finished up this year, which was a $2.5 million greenway park and floodplain restoration project in the downtown, and specifically between the town and the campus, between Bucknell University and downtown it's business districts. Um, there were three state agencies. I passed by that. Um, you could see in the lower left, the Pennsylvania Department of Natural Resource, Conservation, Natural Resources, um, Economic Development and Transportation put together um, almost almost $2 million alone between those agencies to partner on this multifaceted project that, again, is a greenway, a park, a floodplain restoration project, um, all in one. And that's just the most recent example of this very small community being able to put together the partnerships to be able to get something pretty significant done. And the planning process began almost 20 years ago. Ironically, I bring this one to the table because it was the first project I worked on when I came to central Pennsylvania. So I landed at CETA Council of Governments before I did all that, you know, worked my way around the, the Commonwealth. And this was the project that was put in my lap. It was a neighborhood somewhat blighted situation between campus and downtown. And what do we do about it? The college, the university was pulling the students back. The, the, the buildings were going, the structures were going to be abandoned. We worked out an amicable, um, you know, negotiation on that over years. But um, I was the project manager for the very first study in this neighborhood that looked how to reinvent the neighborhood between the town and the campus. And the planning process resulted in many visions for what could be accomplished to improve that neighborhood. We involved children in the planning and development phases. In fact, my kids are up on the screen. <laughs> Um, the one with the green cast is my son. He was probably about eight or nine at the time. And um, my daughter is the one in the purple across the table. But we, we partnered with the Children's Museum. Um, and I was grateful to actually be an implementing um, board member of the, the Lewisburg Children's Museum, which started in 2016. But we were able to use them as a vessel to get to the parents and the student, the, the young children of the community to be able to say, we're building this thing. It's something new. It's called a nature play park. <laughs> What do you want to see? How do you want to engage in nature in a downtown setting? And so they created models and drew pictures and picked from, you know, the sort of pictures on the wall and put dots. They did the whole thing. It was great. It was really great to watch this play out over a few days. Um, so building those partnerships with just about anyone to help realize the best, you know, the best project you possibly can. It, it, it may seem unfathomable that a project of this nature could take almost 20 years to come to fruition. It took 10 years alone from the time the neighborhood plan was created until the houses along the side of the creek were removed. And the reason why that happened was because they were in the floodway. Um, this may seem like an eternity to some, but I consider it a resounding success for a small town. When it comes to things like land acquisition, FEMA buyouts, demolition of 14 structures to clear the floodway obstructions, federal regulations, and building partnerships to succeed, these things do not happen overnight, especially in a small town with very limited to virtually no capacity. And on top of that, it was not an easy task to line up on a lineup of landlord owned income produ producing properties, right? So those properties along the creek that were in the worst shape needed to come down and they were money makers for, you know, <laughs> for the student population, um, the landlords. So this project relied for many years on nonprofit, a nonprofit organization taking the lead to write grants hold public meetings, collect data, and, and maneuver through the trenches. It's not easy, but good planning and perseverance really makes it possible. Um, I did, forgot to take a picture of it today, but here's some of the pathway pieces that go right through the downtown that connect to another rail trail that goes another 10 miles to the west to another community. So it's part of a larger system that goes through the town and the campus. Um, 
And I guess back to patience. Patience has been the name of the game. And now this community has a tremendous asset that is not only more aesthetically pleasing, but it is a functional floodplain, a park, a nature play park at that, and a regional attraction. Here's some before and after pictures. They actually took down the, um, the riprap and the concrete you know, walls that held up the structures beside the creek. And, um, and now we actually have a functioning floodplain, not only here, but we've done it in the township um, upstream. So now you have cleaner water coming into downtown. You have more floodplain capacity, both outside of town retention and detention areas um, that are flowing through natural, you know, natural vegetation and then coming into downtown. Is it the cleanest water? Probably not. Better take a shower after you get like Hugo's and go in there. But but it's it's an opportunity for the for the community and the and the and the kids to get down and touch nature in the community. So it's a special project. And on top of it, hot off the press. This morning I opened my email and I get this sent to me. So last month, <laughs> it was the Bull Run Greenway project was um, awarded the Great Places in Pennsylvania Award. And it just came through today. And so patience and perseverance is a virtue. And that's what we work on. And we're, you know, it's just, it's a lot of work. It's hard, it's hard work, but it is everywhere. The dynamics are always challenging, but this is good stuff. It really is. And then finally, I will end with the politics. It's never a dull moment. <laughs> politics doesn't always support actionable commitments and plans. It's true. It's hard to get multiple elected officials with divergent ideologies and perceptions of priorities and who may come and go with the election cycles to move in a common direction for a sustained period of time. It's hard for elected officials to see past the pressure of the day-to-day -day matters and generate interest in longer-term planning. Um, so they want to keep their options open. Uh, they, you know, we see the turnover and I had to put in here the redistricting or the reapportionment that happens all the time. We're getting different legislators covering our districts on a constant basis. So that makes it challenging. But in the end, asset-based development is one of the strongest core principles for rural planning and economic development work. If we focus on the context of where we are working, who we are working with, and how they can best achieve success, we will have great outcomes. And hopefully we will hit home runs every time. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Happy to take questions, right? Yes, we have some yes. time. First of all, thank you. You're welcome. And thank you very much. Um, yes, questions? Oh, that way. Oh, go ahead. We've moved. Hi. Um, so I'm from rural Missouri, and I feel like in my community, there is a lot of resistance to change. And I think you mentioned how you had a very hard time at first. Um, but for a community that is just in general very stubborn, how do you address that in planning? Stubborn in planning? Did you get? Uh, I think it's. I think it starts with engagement. A lot of what I said here today was about meeting people where they are. Um, so maybe we don't quite use the word planning. <laughs> sometimes we don't use the word zoning. Sometimes we don't, you know, there's a lot of words sometimes we don't use, <laughs> uh, but it's about what do you want to see in your community, right? So even little um, coffee shop opportunities, right? So you have a little after hours, you know, bring a couple people in, you know, you, you bring in organizations that have connection to people that care. And if you start with some of those structures that exist in the community already, um, then you start to have a conversation and then you start to build a conversation. Maybe you're building a vision, maybe you're building a direction and then using the power of the people <laughs> to be able to bring that to others, then people start to get the word. What I've tried to do in my time in Lewisburg is often um, ask the mayor to hold a, a mayor's town hall because I was saying this earlier to, to George when we were having lunch that, Oftentimes, the only time to provide public opinion is at a public 
um, hearing. And a public hearing traditionally is, right, we've made the plan, we've, we have this thing that we need to adopt, or a, you know, regulatory process that needs to go through a public hearing, you get three minutes, you get three minutes, you get three minutes. <laughs> and that's not productive, that doesn't get us to where we want to be. Well, how come I didn't get to hear about this before? Well, well, there was a task force in the back room that did this, and now it's time for you to look at the plan. So I don't advocate for that. I think if us as planners, every step of the way, we have to push that envelope. They don't want to hear it. Sometimes the town managers don't want to be part of that process. That's the hard part, right? They're the ones. So you have to get the elected officials. That's why I went to the mayor, right? So mayor, I think it's your turn to actually engage the community because the structure of the government doesn't want to do it. They don't see value in it. They don't understand it. Get the elected officials. Find someone on the elected officials body and get them to understand they want to be a champion they want to be you know they they want to be a difference maker that's why they were elected get get with elected officials thank you yeah you're welcome hello hello okay yeah hi uh hi uh shanaja salman here i am a first year phd student in the planning program um and i first want to say just thank you i worked as a planner for four years with the national park service okay so going around the country and working in a lot of different rural communities. And so, yes, everything you said is 100% true. Uh, and that's how you get it done on the ground. Um, but I was curious, as I've been working across many different rural communities, I do find that like often you have a few planners serving a pretty large region. So in your case, you're working for a regional council that covers like 11 counties, and I'm sure you have a team. Um, and that can be different, uh, difficult because your team starts to coalesce. Maybe there's some group think. And so how do you kind of make sure that you're, you know, the area that you're serving is also getting new perspectives and stuff like that? You know, you mentioned that it's hard to get new talent to come to rural areas, especially in the planning world, because urban is seen as more sexy and has more job opportunities. So how do you also kind of make sure that y'all are shaking things up and keeping yourselves kind of um, uh, refreshed? Yeah, I think that is a big challenge. I think some of the answer is send people to conferences. <laughs> send them outside the area to learn and see different things happening around the country. Um, that's a big, you know, I, I find that the years go by where certain staff don't get out. Um, it, it becomes, you know, very um, traditional think and in the box. And here's the mechanism of what we go through and stop generating those innovative ideas. So yes, so the conference is one answer. Um, the other big one, which I'm lucky to be able to, to have is the infusion of the, the, the universities and colleges. So when we have an opportunity to partner on a project or have that, you know, student led group or a faculty class, that's where the innovation happens and the communities are blown away they don't even understand that these things can happen i, I bucknell university has come leaps and bounds in the last um the, the two decades that i have been there in terms of putting people on the ground in the more rural and in the more local uh, when i first arrived in lewisburg uh bucknell would for instance send a lot like a lot of their research was done um, outside the area, the more cities and even overseas. And they really turned the corner to focus on the local regional aspect. And we're just, that's just one college, right? We have 12 or 13 of them. We don't partner with all of them, but depending on the project, Penn State has been a great partner too. We get a lot of our innovative think and our entrepreneurial mindset from the college and university. And a lot of times we get approached by the faculty to say, do you have a project in your community? Um, so I don't think there's one answer to that. Um, you need to have leaders that understand, respect and value that. Um, and when you don't, you don't have that happening. And so in and so in the communities, the counties that don't have that type of think, it takes, it takes somebody else to bring that to the table. I, I try to be that as much as I can for the region, but I am only one person. <laughs> so you really need to have a little army, you know, like you said, like a little team that understands that. Um, it's challenging, it's challenging, but it's a, I don't know if I have a nugget of, you know, a silver bullet there, but I think there's a combination of ways to, to make sure that your staff are leading in the, in the best innovative way. And I, I think it's always a challenge, to, and resources is a challenge to get people to go to those conferences, right? But. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kim. This was fantastic. Thank you oh, for the work you do. Thanks, Nima. Um, Good to see you. 
so so here's my question i want to follow up on you know what you said about bringing new both sending folks out and bringing people in right and you talked about these um you know the the work that you're doing with penn state and bucknell can you tell us a little bit more about how you choose which university to engage with which kinds of projects do you say yes to what are the challenges in terms of so, you know, the implementation of a partnership? Mm -hmm. I love your focus on implementation. Okay. We just don't hear enough about it. Yeah. And so about the implementation of a partnership with the university. I think a lot of times it stems from the project itself, right? So we, I mean, it really comes from, uh, right the planning process <laughs> if you're working through it with figuring out who can be the implementing partners then you're bringing them to the table early it doesn't happen all the time right this is a new concept that i've been trying to get take hold in the region but um we're fairly familiar with the types of of departments and programs at the different universities um at least for the work that we do so when we come upon a project that um uh, you know, I've, I'm thinking of Penn State and some of their, um, they have some of some community and economic development folks, landscape architecture that dealing with flood resiliency right now, a huge focus in Laura Fowler's shop over in Penn State in, in flood resiliency. And we have just been able to, in multiple counties, be able to identify an, a project that her and her team can work on. I'm not sure, you know, that like all of those details, but it's, it, we are, pro, most of the time we're approaching <laughs> based on a project that we know of in our counties, in, you know, that's coming through our ranks. Um, um, which ones do we say yes to? Which ones do they say no to? Well, that's um, most of the time, it's never a no. <laughs> um, but we can always find somewhere for a, um, for, a, for a school group, a classroom to work. So I, I don't have a great, you know, sort of formulaic uh, answer. I think there's enough rural communities that need assistance to go around. So we are often in that position of matchmaker. Right. So if a, you know, if a, if a university comes to us and says, we really have this kind of expertise and need a pro, you know, a project, then we can help direct them based on the work that we know in our communities. So it, it's kind of a give and take um, and, and a reputation over time that you build. Um, and sometimes we are presenting on, on panels together with the faculty. So they get to know us, we get to know them. Um, we're in their backyard and uh, it, it's not a science, but I think it's just a relationship building. And so whenever we can use that opportunity, I think, frankly, we need to do it more. Um, but that, those university community partnerships have been some of the strongest ways of which of leading change in, the, in our area, really. It's been wonderful. Yeah. Even in the coal communities, you see there's so much interest in the coal communities by faculty. I've been really enjoying that. Um, and energy resiliency and res like all of that it's just been it's been a phenomenal interest in our region from the local universities welcome back hello uh, mr booth how are you good two questions uh a regional effort that's now gone on for decades um how many communities have adopted enforceable implementable plans to use your language uh, across the community, and what, what percentage? And the, the reason I ask that is because here in Tompkins County, we're in 2022. A number of communities in this county don't have implementable comprehensive plans decades after I got here, all right? <laughs> and, 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 and probably aren't going to decades from now. So what percentage? That's the first question. I don't know about the percentage. But it is a growing interest in the planning field, at least in Pennsylvania right now, because uh, that's where we started this <laughs> this concept. I and mean, it's been shopped around at conferences and you know counties for for probably about three years now, maybe five. I mean, I've been working on it for for years. Um, but also at the national level through the American Planning Association conferences. Uh, so there has been some conference presentations there. I don't have an idea of how many are taking it under their wing. But Would you guess it's fifty percent? No, it's less. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. That, that's that's interesting. Yep. The second question well, just is because I think it takes time for no, no, there absolutely. to be, you know, catching on and all of that. But in Pennsylvania, it's a big talk of the town. Like it is, people are like, "I'm not doing a plan." I, mean, I, with I this. think that's probably fairly typical of much of rural America, which is where you began. Yeah. Uh, second question: most 
rural areas in the country don't have the advantage of a federally funded regional commission that's you know providing some overall support right yep and so state governments are obviously the critical actors. All of these local governments derive all of their authority from the state. What are the three biggest things Pennsylvania could do to advance uh, planning and implementation of plans, obviously, in rural areas in Pennsylvania? I mean, if you if you were going to see the governor tomorrow, and the governor asked you for three or four significant things, what would they be? Reduce the match requirement on the grants. <laughs> I mean, it's a big, it's a big hurdle. The rural communities don't have the capital to be able to get the projects done, and the the gymnastics and contortions that they have to do to cobble together matches is just it's 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 a barrier. And when you're looking at billions of dollars coming down from the federal government through the bipartisan infrastructure law, I mean, it's a scary thought to yet again that divergence between urban and rural, metro and non-metro, um, sophisticated, non-sophisticated, whatever you want to call that, it is a big divide that we're going to continue to see if we don't have a recognition that rural areas don't have the capacity to put up that match. But yet we have significant needs to keep and sustain yeah, uh, I mean, the needs are there the needs so so that's one um their needs i mean i can't underscore capacity there's just capacity so whether you want to stock it at the state level and have an infusion you know into the communities uh, you know the regions when i worked at the state we had a nice little um cadre of planners that each had regions and it has dwindled to one or two people in Harrisburg today. There's just no capacity. So there's no leadership at the top. You have great community and economic development programs. And I'm now spilling a little bit of guts here about Pennsylvania, but we, you know, in other states, there's a lot more investment in the community and economic development leadership of the state government. And we are lacking that in Pennsylvania. So if I was going to talk to the governor tomorrow, I would ask him to reinvent the capacity at the, at the state level to be able to support the communities, 2,566 of them that have very little capacity. So capacity and well, money. We're in New York and it's not not much better. Any significantly better. Not yeah. not in the real rural parts of the state. One of the things that the Brookings Institute, and I alluded to this a little bit, but when I in my talks with Tony Pippa, the fellow at Brookings, said was he's done so much much research in internationally and nationally, now he's focusing more nationally, uh, is that when we send money overseas to international organizations for aid, et cetera, it comes along with the capacity. We bring the people to help. But in America, we just send the money and go for it. Go do it, figure it out. <laughs> here's all. The, here's the matrix of all the funding that you can go for. It's really complicated. We're not really sure how you're gonna administer it, but you can have access to it. So it's uh, there. that's what I, when I said earlier, there just needs to be a, a, a retooling of the architecture of how we are sending money and handling um, our uh, our expectation of success <laughs> in a lot of ways, um, because we're not going to get there by just dumping money. Because truly what we have found for three years in the city of Shimoka, in that coal community I spoke about, having a person on the ground was that we are building, a, like, I don't know, I'm hopeful that they're going to turn that corner, but they are building success in the ability to be able to have capacity and leadership and training and mentoring in one organization because she helps to really bring that understanding and co they don't know how to do it otherwise. They just don't know how to do it. It's really made a difference. Having a person is such a great example, but we're gonna, you know, we're gonna be out of that person to come June of next year without a, a clear funding source to how to keep that going. So, uh, did you have another question? Did I answer? Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Over, over here on the left. Hello. Thank you so much for the presentation. We've got a question online on Zoom from one of our students as well. So I'm just going to read it out for you. Okay. And um, she's a first year MRP student. And on her behalf, the question is, what I want to know a little more about is working in rural and regional planning. There may be differences in who holds authority over certain jurisdictions or territories for certain fields within planning, say for transportation or environmental planning. How do you manage conflict or, con or contestation within these authorities if there have been any within these projects, since the aim would have been to have a comprehensive plan and not work in silos? I 
Okay. How do we manage the conflict between the authorities that have different? <laughs> wow. Okay. So, I mean, you enter that all the time. Um, it's not a one size fits all answer. I mean, truly, uh, I think for the most part, what the 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 organizations that you're working with on a on a I'm going to use a project as an example. Um, it's it's no different than a, maybe a negotiations class <laughs> in a lot of ways. What's the outcome? What's the problem we're trying to solve? Um, who can bring what resources? And sometimes it, you know, sometimes you do encounter bullying. I'm going to say that, right? I mean, bullying from one organization to another that thinks it has more authority than another organization. And there's teachable moments every time you have a conversation to teach how and why. A lot of times you have to go in armed and prepared to give that rationale from various angles. You have to understand the context from the perspective of the other person's conflicting opinion. And it's, you know, you it's it's a it's an exercise in creativity sometimes and trying to figure out what's going to make that person tick, right? So the engineer at PennDOT doesn't always look at things uh, in any similar way as a community planner. And what's going to, what's, how are we going to get to the end result by getting them to say yes, <laughs> by getting, you know, by it really advancing what's going to make them tick. So it's really, it's understanding the the perspective and the goal of each and every organization that's coming to the table. And sometimes it's one-on-ones, you know, you need to have those conversations up front. Sometimes you need to have an influencer um, that is working with you, beside you, behind you, that's coming in to, to make those, uh, you know, those connections and really provide that rationale. Um, but it's, it, it's not an easy task, but there's, it's a, it's a myriad of, of different people at the table that you have to really understand how they, what makes them what makes them want to say yes? <laughs> Hi. Hi, thanks so much for your talk. Um, I'm a second year MRP student and I'm working with a group of students on a planning project for the village of Dryden, okay. which is 2000 um, people in their population. And one thing that we're struggling with um, with our site plan is finding good data, especially um, around sort of like, what are the needs for more housing or retail establishments? And um, a lot of like the national um, services that we have access to through Cornell, like CoStar, don't really have data on yeah. small villages. Right. Um, so how do you find good data to know the needs of rural communities? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, a lot of times, this is not the greatest answer, but you, you actually are going to the community itself <laughs> to understand the dynamics of what is there. It's like, it's actually almost creating your own survey in a lot of ways, right? So what's on the ground, what, and working with economic professionals that can help to analyze um, whether or not there's a market segment opportunity for certain businesses or certain industries. Um, and it's not something you're gonna be able to pull a data piece from. Now, with that said, I think you also need to look contextually outside of that community, right? A small community of 2000 isn't going to necessarily, you know, have its own data set, but also where does it sit within? So it's, if it's sitting within a region that has a cluster of X type of, you know, business, um, you know, industries, or it has an economic advantage of whether it's a natural resource or, in, you know, in whatever that is, I think just understanding where they sit in the bigger picture is very helpful too. So not just pulling Dryden information, but looking at the bigger, right? And so maybe Ithaca is not like quite, the, but it might be, right? If we sit still within a region um, that has a dynamic, you need to understand. So this, that going back to the assets, what are the assets of that community? What makes it tick? What gives it its competitive advantage? And sometimes that data is more, um, it, it's just, it's more, customized. You have to really go get on the ground and talk to the economic development professionals, the business professionals, the people who have, who know the community to understand that those, some, some of those component parts. Um, I don't have a great, you know, in terms of housing needs, that's like, I go back to the county. 
you know, looking at the county and what the and how can Dryden play a piece of the overall county need. So to me, when you're looking at a community that small, you're trying to figure out what its competitive advantage is within its county and then its bigger region. And sometimes that's so super local that the community needs to come together to answer that question. Yeah. Quick, one more. Quick. Okay. Okay. I had a comment actually more than a question. Swati, do you want to go first? You can go first. Can, you I sure? Yeah. Okay. So Kim, it's more of a comment than a question, really. But I was struck by, you know, you said the Brookings guy, who I don't know, who said, oh, America sends um, capacity along with USAID funds to people um, outside the US. But, you know, I'm listening to you. And from my experience of the work that I've done sure. internationally, yeah. I can say that marginal communities, rural communities, out, you know, outside U.S. communities, the, the issues would be very similar to what you're talking about. Those U.S. AID planners who come along typically screw things up more for the local folks. They don't really help, right? So I'm kind of thinking what's really interesting to me is what you identified as what you need in Pennsylvania, which is planners at, in that local agency who can help support local planners like yourself. And that's really interesting. And you keep coming back to the question of context and of how you generate materials locally, how you build capacity locally, how you support people locally. And if that's, and it's so striking because that is the same question that comes up in community after community internationally and here. And it's the problem when USAID sends huh. American trained pl uh, planners internationally it's a problem similarly like it may likely be a problem for you if a new york city planner goes to an appalachian region in pennsylvania right right so i mean i do think this question of context that you 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 bring it up so much in every answer huh. and it's central yeah it's central so it's thank you thank it's you a for wonderful picking up on that i appreciate yeah. that yeah you should, so you should tell the brookings guy uh, that maybe usid needs to change his okay. policy <laughs> thank you Nima. Um, oh. uh, thank you for your talk. There's one more. Yeah. George, is that okay? Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, so when I think rural America, I think predominantly white communities. Um, so I was wondering if you have experience working with indigenous communities and other non-white communities, and if there are like different um, sensitivities that uh, you bring to the table when, when you're dealing with them, considering the trauma and like blight, like blight conditions that they've been through. Is there something that you do which is different from um, the other uh, things you've spoken about in terms of implementation? That's a great question. The answer is no. Um, it's still the same process. You need to get, you need to understand the people first. So I haven't worked with indigenous communities, but surely, you know, communities of color in cities and neighborhoods, you know, where you're really trying to, uh, to empower the people to have a voice because they don't typically come to the meeting at city hall, right? So you're going to them and their churches and their coffee shops and their, you know, round tables. And it's really about learning about them, their lifestyle, what, you know, how they operate. So it's really sort of the same process. I don't have another answer. I don't do anything different. I know there's, but you need to learn their sensitivities. And I don't do that until I can get with them to really understand. And sometimes it's multiple meetings. To to really understand where do they where do they go what makes them comfortable how, where do they not go you know all of those types of things to really understand how do we create a plan for that community that neighborhood that's going to make sense same process but thank thanks you. for asking thank you for the great questions today all right we are at time but i wanted to let you guys know that we have another session with ms wheeler at 2 30 the women's planning forum and career services are jointly holding a panel at uh, or not panel an event with her at 2 30 in sibley room 105 and you can go and chat with her if you have more questions if you have questions about careers what it's like to be a woman planner in this kind of a community in a conservative place which perhaps political differences all those kinds of really wonderful questions. It'll be a more intimate setting when you can discuss them with her. Please join me in thanking our speaker today.